Tim, Eileen, and I, and we, uh, we spent a lot of time in Tennessee, uh, which I didn't know that was possible, but we did a lot <laughs> in Tennessee. And, uh, and one night, we were at the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, it wasn't Mozart, I, I just wanted to put the record in. But um, we were sitting there, Pamela and I were there, and uh, uh, Eileen had decided to skip that. Uh, and uh, but Pam and I were there, uh, and uh, she leaned over and said, have you got lots of good sermon ideas from our trip? <laughs> and I went, no. <laughs> it's Tennessee. It's Tennessee. And what am I going to do, you know, with, uh, you know, cracker barrels, you know? So, uh, and she said, well, I'm going to pray that you're going to get a good idea for a sermon. I went, okay. <laughs> kind of the Westfall roll the eyes. All right, you know. Go ahead, pray on. And, uh, and then uh, uh, the lead singer from a band, Sugarland, which, by the way, we did visit Sugarland, and it, uh, to quote Jake, it's a lot of Aurora uh, leading into Dollywood. <laughs> but anyway, so there, so there is a place. Anyway, the band, Sugarland, the lead singer, got up to play at the Grand Ole Opry, and he said, I'd like to do a new song called Trailer Hitch. I thought, you know, this is so Tennessee. <laughs> and then he said these words. You know what they say in Tennessee? Yeah. And I thought to myself, no. <laughs> what do they say? And he said, there ain't no trailer hitch on a hearse. <laughs> <laughs> and I leaned over and went, I got it! <laughs> trailer hitch on a hearse. The people of Tennessee are so right. Yeah, it just happened. We've been in a series of messages on uh, conversations with Jesus. And this week, our conversation is from Matthew 19. Uh, if you want to follow with me, I'll just read it here to you. Um, now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me what's good, Jesus said. There's only one who's good. If you want to enter uh, life, obey the commandments. Which ones? <laughs> yeah, because I'm a pretty smart guy. Which ones? Just answer his bets. Jesus said, do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And love your neighbor as yourself. Well, all these I've kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be whole, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away very sad, because he had great wealth. And Jesus said to his disciples, you know what? It is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, Lord, teach us from your word. Teach us uh, what this means in our lives. and Not just uh, an account in the Bible, but uh, your word to us today. Um, you know, I've heard this story through Sunday school and uh, growing up and everything, the rich young ruler, that's what they always call it, you know, the rich young ruler. And there's accounts in all the three Gospels about this. And, uh, and I always thought, you know, here's somebody who's, who's really got it together. A, they say he's rich. That's the first definition right there, first description. Two, he's young, you know, he's, he's energetic, he, he's got a lot of sex appeal. And uh, three, he's got power. And he seemed to be well spoken and, uh, you know, they're able to banter pretty good with Jesus. A rich, young ruler. And he seems to be faithful as far as he can be. And, uh, and I thought, why does Jesus not go after his power? Why does Jesus not say, you know, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to give up your ruling people, <laughs> you know, your 
decision made. Well, you need to let that go. Because for some people, power is a big issue that keeps them from following Jesus. Why didn't he say, you're too young, why don't you grow up, live life a little? <laughs> Jesus might have quoted Westfall, you know, uh, you got to go out there and uh, make a lot of mistakes, you know, before you can follow Jesus. And uh, he didn't say that. Maybe, maybe Jesus knew that, that both uh, youth and old age will end. And so um, it didn't really matter. But instead, you think about this, the, the young ruler comes in and says, what do I have to do? I've got everything. My life is good. What do I have to do for eternal life? And I think that's one of the greatest questions that anybody's ever come and asked Jesus. What do I have to do? Not what do I have to know? What do I have to believe? What do I have to understand? What do I have to commit to? None of that. It's what do I have to do? Let's get practical. And uh, you know, Jesus' answer is a typical uh, kind of answer. You know, well, why don't you follow the commandments? Um, I would love that he says, which ones? <laughs> you know, there's a lot out there. You know? <laughs> Any in particular, Lord? <laughs> and then Jesus goes and names off a few of the Ten Commandments, right? And then he throws in one that's not a Ten Commandment. He tricked them. You notice that? Honor your father and mother, don't kill, don't lie, don't steal, don't do And love your neighbors yourself. And I could just hear, like, night driving in Tennessee. Hey! <coughs> you know, uh, as, as this whole conversation skids to a halt. I do all of this. Life's not whole. I don't have eternal life. It's not working for me that well. I do all that. And Jesus said, okay, great. You do all that. Go sell your stuff. Give to the poor. Follow me. He said, he went away sad. He didn't go away sad because, uh, you know, he was poor and didn't have much to offer and all this stuff. He went away. Why? Because he had an abundance. In fact, the uh, the Greek word is it's uh, that um, he had much stuff. He had much stuff. That actually is more meaningful to me than than being rich or not. You know, because nobody ever thinks they're rich. Uh, even the ones who I know are don't think they are. But we've got a lot of stuff. Um, and he had much stuff, many things, and uh, it reminded me of in the last election, the, uh, one of the candidates' wives, when they released their income tax for the year, and said that they made $22 million that year in their investments, and, and she said, well, we're not rich, <laughs> you know, because they know rich people. So they're not rich. Everybody has that kind of feeling, it's not us. But he had many things. Many things, yeah. Lots of things. And I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm in the midst of moving tomorrow. The, mover, <laughs> the movers come. And I identify with this young man, <laughs> even at my advanced age. I, I have many things. <laughs> I don't even know the things I have because there's boxes that were packed 10 years ago that haven't been unpacked. They're still in the garage. And now i got to open them to see what's in them, to repack them, to move them to the new place. What's that? I know. Don't do that. Just leave them. <laughs> Surprise the new tenants. You know? And, uh, woo -hoo. But, um, I got many things. And I remember it was, it was an interesting thing last night because um, I'm about a 10 on the tension scale. Blues. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's going a lot of directions right now. And I got home and Eileen greeted me at the door with, we're going to La, La Quinta. 
That's it, in Linwood. You know, that's, that's how nice the town is. And uh, I go, why? We're having a power failure. There's no power. The house is out. The neighborhood is out. I said, well, what about the big house across the street? They've got lights. Yes, they have generators. We don't. We can't stay here. And, uh, and the house is filled with crap, you know, in boxes, out of boxes, uh, you know, and all this stuff, getting ready for the move tomorrow. And, uh, and I said, well, I'm tired. I'm just with there. So let's get some candles and lit some candles. And then I put a fire, the fire going, and then we're sitting there. We can look around the boxes and see the fire. <laughs> and, uh, and I started rubbing her feet, you know, and talking, and then we started talking about when we were uh, early on, you know, 40 some years ago, we'd move into an apartment and we wouldn't have had the electricity turned on yet, and we'd be sitting on the floor because the furniture, we don't know where anything is, and didn't have much anyway, and we'd be eating pizza out of a box with candlelight. And I was sitting there like, we are so blessed. How cool to sit here in the dark with candles rubber feet, we can talk about 40 years ago. We couldn't see all the stuff. It all rooms were dark. Couldn't see what we had around us. It all disappeared. I thought, wow, we are so blessed. And then the lights came on. And I gotta admit, I had the sense of sadness when the lights came on. Because we had a much stuff. And it's like, Back to stressing, you know. and uh, but but it's an interesting thing because what do we do? Uh, I grew up. This well, let's do. We'll talk about. We talk about money too, right? Is that right to do or not? Okay. Never done that before, so I, don't, I get nervous here. But uh, okay, so I grew up. You know, in our family, uh, my parents modeled this. They never talked about it. They just modeled it that they would tithe as Christians, and they would bring, you know, 10% of their income to the Lord. And my dad always explained to me that what this means is you give God his 10%, and then you have your 90% for yourself, and you can do whatever the hell you want with it. <laughs> my dad said it. It's to quote him. And, uh, and that's what I believed. And I actually would preach that in the early years. And I'd say, you know, this is the greatest thing in the world. You make God your partner in your life and your finances, and you bring your biblical tithe, and then you can have the rest of it and all the blessings for yourself. And then it dawned on me, that is so not what Jesus is calling us to. God doesn't want our 10%. He wants all of it. The whole deal. He wants the other 92. <laughs> we give him our 10 and then he takes the 90. <laughs> and says, you're going to make a killing in the afterlife. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Jesus tells him. Right? What's the problem? Jesus wants our whole life. You know, to sell your stuff, get rid of your many things, give it away to the poor. And, and you know why that'd be difficult for this guy? He probably doesn't know anybody who's poor. If you're rich and powerful, that means that you were probably connected since birth. And you've got stuff coming in and you've got people around you and you've got all this stuff. You don't know anybody who's poor, so how are you going to give it away? Even if you sold it, what are you going to do? You'd have to find some corporate organization who can find a poor person to give it to. You don't know. Right? We, don't, we don't have those people in our lives. We don't see them usually. Unless something extraordinary happens. <laughs> now, if everything belongs to the Lord, and we're following Jesus, in exchange for being free from all this stuff, uh, burdening us, Guess what happens to this guy? If he would have sold everything and given it to the poor and followed Jesus, you know what would have happened? I bet he would have still been rich. And Jesus didn't ask him to give up his power positions or his youth. So he'd still be a young, rich ruler following Jesus because it's like, you know, when you put your hand in a lake and you pull it out, you know how long that hole stays there that your hand was? It just goes back up again. And 
you know, people that I know who I would think are rich, that's what happens to them. It fills up again. And they'll tell stories about I was rich, and then I was bankrupt, and then I made some money, and then I lost it all, and then it kind of, and, and you go, wow. So it wouldn't have actually changed his life that much. The only thing that would have changed was his heart. That he wouldn't have been held back by, by as many things. Now how do we do this? How do we do this? How do we get face to face with need? And how do we allow God to use us and who we are and what we've got and all those things for, for to bless others? There's a, a Mark a Laberton, some of you know. Um, uh, he was a pastor for a long time in Berkeley, down in California, when I was in Walnut Creek, we were neighbors, and uh, now he's the president of Fuller Seminary. But uh, we've been in a small group for like 15 years. And this summer we met, and he was sharing about the experience he had when he was at Berkeley. And there was a lady, an older lady, who would come, he would get there early to the church for the first sermon, and she would already be there. She'd be in a back pew, in the same spot, and she would be there sitting in a purse, sweater over her shoulders, and she would be sitting there. And uh, and after watching this, you know, for about a year, he went up and he said, you know, it's so great that you come here and you pray and you listen to the choir warm up and you just kind of get in the spirit. And you're early for church. That's so great. I wish others would learn from you. And she said, no, that's not what I'm doing. She said, you know, this is Berkeley. And the sidewalks are filled with druggies and homeless people and people asking for money and stuff. And so I come <clears throat> really early so I can park up close. And I don't have to park down the street or in the church parking lot and walk here past all those people. I don't want to see those people. So I come early and I sit here until church is over. And then I've got my car right there so I can go home. He said his whole illusion of phones are spiritual. And so he said it was really weird because he watched this and then um, uh, about six months later there had been a challenge to kind of reach out to the people in the community, the homeless people and the sidewalk people and the druggies and all that stuff. <clears throat> and so she accepted the challenge and she went and bought uh, little coupons for some of the food places around. Uh, she called them chits, she said. <laughs> I had my chits. And uh, and she would park her car and then she would walk around the block to the church. And she <laughs> this was really funny because she would walk, she'd hold her purse close and she'd walk and she'd have her chits and as she passed someone she'd flip it over. <laughs> and then keep walking and then take some others. There's like three people, you know, take, take three of them. <laughs> and then they could pick them up. And she did that for a while. And then, um, then uh, it said about a month, she was doing that, and then uh, she decided she didn't have to throw them on the sidewalk. She could just take them up to them. She walked by. Right? Just keep walking. And uh, it said, she came to them one day and said, um, something strange happened that I talked to you about. I went by, and I said, after a while, they're the same people, you know, and uh, and uh, I went by, and I handed the guy the shit, and uh, I was walking away, and I got a little ways away, and he went, hey, lady! And she rose with the purse, and, 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 uh, and she turned around, and he came running towards her and gave her this big hug. And uh, it probably lasted too long. <laughs> I gave her this big hug. I said, uh, you've been doing this for quite a while. Thanks for, thanks for thinking of us. My name's Alan. And uh, some of us here, uh, you know, we really appreciate it. You come by doing this. And she wanted something to go off to church. What I said, about two months later, she, he started noticing that this lady wasn't in her seat when church started. And she kept coming later and later. And so he stopped her after service and said, Is there something wrong? Are you having trouble? You're not here. She was, Well, you know, I go up to see Alan uh, every morning. We get talking and, and everything. And we're having such a great time, you know, that I, time gets away from me. And then I forget and I have to come. And they call me church lady. <laughs> <laughs> and think about that. And you go, Why would Jesus tell?
tell this guy, you know, you got a bunch of stuff. You got whoa, a lot of stuff. Why don't you get rid of that stuff and just give it away to the poor? Why don't you drop stuff on people as you walk along? Why would Jesus tell them to do that? Because, like the church lady, pretty soon you might actually find yourself in a relationship. And it makes a difference. And then you're part of the community and you notice people differently. And you talk to people differently. And you may not be comfortable at first. And you may be throwing your stuff on them and hurting them. <laughs> Depending on what the stuff is. But, but the, the point is, you're free. You're so free. I think I want to be free. I'm a little bit afraid of freedom. Um, but I don't want to just believe the Bible. I don't want to just believe the commandments. Like this guy believed the commandments, he had no idea what his implications were. Remember Jesus said, you know, if you're angry at somebody, you kill, you kill them. If you're lusting after somebody, you're, you're committing adultery. You're making up stuff for self-protection. You're bearing false witness, you know. It goes beyond the technical. And this guy says, oh, yeah, I do all of those things. Yeah, I love my neighbors myself. I don't even know the name. I'm so busy with all my stuff. And so, I was tempted. Okay, let me tell you, this is how I was tempted to say, this verse, this passage, should be the centerpiece of how we handle our finances. Right? That'd be good. But then I realized this is the only time Jesus said this to somebody. He didn't say this to everybody. He didn't say this to, you know, Nicodemus or anybody. He just, he went, for you then, you're so devoted to your stuff that you can't. And I think the guy went away sad because I think he really wanted to follow Jesus. And it made him sad that he couldn't. Jesus says, come, follow me. Now, have you noticed in the Bible that Jesus would walk up to people, tax, Matthew the tax collector, follow me. What would Matthew do? Close down the table, get up, and follow him. Right? Peter and James, and they're all fishing out there. Come follow me. They drop the nets, the boats, leave dead with that. Follow Jesus. This happened all the time, except here. Come follow me. Have a relationship with me. Live with me. And uh, go to my cell. Because I got many things. You know, I need to see for myself, Lord, can I follow you? Can I follow you instead of hanging on to many things? And it's not just things like stuff, it's also things like other commitments and time stuff and things. Can I divest my life and invest in you? Invest in the kingdom? That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do this year. That's going to be my own personal challenge. Instead of hiring stuff and things and people and all those things, I want to give that away and say, Lord, Okay, what are we going to do today? What's going to happen today? Because if you don't need, if you've got everything taken care of, you don't need the Lord. So, what's the message here? Repeat with me. Ain't no trailer hitch on our hearts. <laughs> no, you didn't say that like you believe. I want to hear it like a Tennessee person. Like, Ain't no trailer hitch on our hearts. So, Lord, take all that we are, all that we have. Forgive us.
Give us the courage to follow you and not go away sad.